So uh, if the heart beats, does the brain hear it? <laughs> Let's get started, eh? I think Sam's already answered this question. How do I... I is this going to beat? There it is. So I think the answer is yes. Yeah, we don't need a philosopher, we just need Sam. And this is the beating brain, and I think round of applause to Sam, Sam for bringing this to the world. So um, my talk today is re I'm trying to bring the heart in connection with the brain because clearly there is an intimate connection, and that exists from the very earliest days of conception when the, you know, two to three weeks when the embryo is first forming and the notochord and the heart tube and the pharyngeal arches and there's a, there's a direct connection of, of cranial and subcranial nerves that travel through those arches and inform the development of the heart and, and it probably goes back and forward. So uh, even though in an adult the heart seems a long way away, at, at, at development and throughout life, there is a very much an intimate connection between the two. And I think as Professor Hunter highlighted, everything is interconnected in the body. Um, and so let's have a look at the, but my, my, my real interest is, and love is blood um, and the heart, obviously. I'm with Dr. Nash. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this is the human heart uh, pumping blood to the brain through the red, so you can see pretty clearly there's two, there's two ventricles and two outlets. And people always use blue for the deoxygenated blood going to the lungs and then it comes back into the body and as oxygenated blood red and gets pumped around to the brain and to the body. So um, the other thing to note on that is that, you know, that while these two pumps look side by side and they appear parallel, they're not. And the other thing is that the as Martin also highlighted, that the, on the red side, there is a spiral uh, axial rotation in the, in the red blood. It even twists underneath the pulmonary artery and rolls over the top, whereas the blue blood remains a laminar flow, as it was in the, heart, in the single heart tube. And that really, as a scientist, got me to question, well, why? Why is there rotational blood in the red side? And that really you know, to, that's kind of science 101, right? It's like make an observation, you make a hypothesis, you test it. It kind of led me down a bit of a rabbit hole as well, um, but let's go down there a little bit. Um, so this is a sort of a simplified version of the circulation as a whole. We've looked at the brain, we've looked at the heart, but between them is the blood, and what connects, you know, touches everything and forms and feeds us is that circulation. And in the 1600s, there was a, a physician, the King's physician, William Harvey, who promulgated this idea that blood is a one-way circuit. It goes from the blue from the body around, loops through the heart as blue blood to the lungs, where it gets oxygenated, and then it rolls back into the heart and gets re-accelerated around to the body where the oxygen gets stripped out and used by the mitochondria. So in some way, you know, I like to think of it like a bit of an electrical circuit in a way. It's picking up oxygen, which is electrons, and delivering it to the body where the, the, the mitochondria, the motor, are using those and it comes back and gets more. So, and, and you know, like I said in the first slide, it's sort of easy to think of the, the ventricles are in parallel, but they're not. They're two loops in a, in a loop, in a, in a circuit that is in series. And, the, and you can see why, though, that William Harvey described them as bellows, because they're, they're kind of working synchronously. It's almost, and I'll, as you'll see when I kind of work, work through this, it's like the the red loop has developed out of the blue loop in, in the embryogenesis process. And I should just give a quick shout out to Al Fener, uh, Fener, Al Fener in the 1300s, uh, actually first described the circulation of blood. I know it's popularized by William Harvey, but in fact, in the 1300s, he described the first passage of the, uh, described the pulmonary passage, which uh, really takes science back, uh, way back into the early centuries. And the other thing, and so the other thing about the, you know, blood, and just to riff on this a bit more, the blue and the red, the other thing that's changing here is, the only thing that's changing is oxygenation. So you kind of go, why, why do we use blue and red? And the fundamental thing about oxygen, uh, about heme, is when it binds oxygen, it, it's sharing electrons, blood switches from paramagnetic to a, a diamagnetic state, and the affinity for light 
changes with it. Blue deoxygenated blood has a 10 times greater affinity for absorbing light. It has a real sultriness about it when you look at it in the body and uh, a moodiness about it. And then when it's br and, and when it oxygenated, it's bright red. It's night and day, but it's the same fluid, but just the matter of oxygenation uh, really changes the nature of the, of the fluid. And when you get down to microscopic levels, that becomes quite interesting. And that's where we're gonna kind of go shortly. So this is, um, this is a 3D reconstruction from an MRI of a neonate. It's a normal heart. Um, and it kind of highlights again just what I've been telling you in terms of the, the two pumps side by side. You can see the, the, the laminar aspect of the pulmonary artery going to the lungs. The blue blood, the red blood comes back into the left ventricle, which is really spiraled out in this asymmetric ascending aortic arch. And then you can see at the top uh, the uh, carotid arteries which come from the pharyngeal arches, the third pharyngeal arches, and the subclavians, which are going to the arms, which are actually intercostal branches. And off the back of them, you can't quite see... Uh, oh, hang on, push the wrong button. Never mind. Can I go back? Doesn't matter. We'll move on. <laughs> what I was going to show you was there's the carotid arteries at the front, but there's the vertebral arteries at the back, which are kind of a, a distillation of the... or a remnant of the original dorsal circulation in the... In the uh, in the uh, embryo, and kind of like, you know, well, how did, and so how did that complex asymmetric heart with two ventricles and crossing over outlets form out of a single looped, essentially a fish heart? This is actually a heart out of a fish, uh, out of a 95 kg black marlin. Um, and the things that are striking about it are, it's bisymmetric down the midline. I've split it through the dorsally, uh, and so it's a single atrium, it's a single ventricle, and it's a single outlet with the gill arches, much like uh, in, the, in the very early embryo stages. So a single blue loop going through gill arches, going to the dorsal aorta. And what's really interesting, and I hadn't really thought about this, is that in the fish heart, the oxygenated blood, once it goes through the gills, it does not get pumped to the body like it does in us. It drifts. There's, there's, no, there's no, you know, it's gone through a massive you know, capillary system called the gill, gills, where it's getting oxygenated by the oxygen in the, in, the, uh, in the water. But beyond that, it goes into the dorsal arteries and there's nothing pumping it to the brain or to, or to the body. Uh, it's quite interesting. Um, I'd never really thought of that. And so really, so, the, so my point is though, that the fish brain is getting a little bit, is getting oxygen through those dorsal arteries, which are kind of the, really the remnants of your vertebrals and not much else. Um, and... If we move on to the <clears throat> next slide, so we're getting, getting down into the heart tube now. This is in an embryo about two to three weeks old. It's actually a chick embryo, but it's really good for, uh, as a surrogate for human heart development because the, 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 the bird has a four-chambered heart. And if you think about it for a minute, it's actually a biped like us. It has wings. We can't fly, but they can walk on two legs, not like normal mammals. So they, they have a very similar heart structure to humans in lots of ways, and so it makes a good model. And you can see again, they have, uh, it's, it's a, single a single atrium into a single ventricle into a single outlet, and beyond that are the pharyngeal arches to the gills. Uh, so it's like, well, how does this evolve into this four-chambered double outlet crossed over heart? And now remember, all the blood coming through here at, the point, at this point from the body is blue. It's deoxygenated blood going through and, but in the embryo, you have a thing called the placenta, uh, which, you know, from the very beginning, from the very beginning, the, there's the embryo and the placenta, and the placenta's job is to deliver oxygen to that developing uh, embryo and fetus to, to, uh, as it grows. And so into this, into this tube enters oxygenated blood. And we know from clinical, from, you know, from uh, people who have done studies with this, that flow through here is lamina. You can introduce, it doesn't, you know, a stream from one side does not mix with a stream from the other side. And we see that in adults as well, flows, blood tends to stream. So the question I had at the beginning was, how do we go from the single looped sort of fish heart to a double looped circulation? And it really... Uh, which is really kind of where my blood hypothesis comes in. And, and uh, to be, you know, it's, it's sort of like 
the river shapes the bed as much as the bed shapes the river is kind of what I'd like to, how I'd like to position it, you know, and, and so I think, you know, we've heard a lot about structure and genetics and things like this and how those change things, but also flow, we know flow changes things as well, so it's a, it's a two-way street. Uh, but what people have really, have people, uh, people have known that blood switches its polarity, it changes its colour with oxygenation, and this is a very powerful physiological response that we use in plethysmography to determine your oxygen saturation if you're in your hospital and you're monitoring your thing because it's measuring the differences in, in light absorption. It's also used in MRI on a daily basis because deoxygenated blood is, is more paramagnetic and has a different signal about it. So, but we've really not looked at it in the sub-millimeter scale through the developing heart and what effect that might have because below a millimeter in tubes physics changes, it's about uh, shear stresses dominate over pressure and flow. It's, it's sort of like quantum mechanics versus gravitational mechanics. There's two different rules for two different scales. So the, the assumption of the, of the blood hypothesis is that at these small diameters, the electrostatic charges or forces within the streaming, you know, blood, blue and red blood streams may have an effect on their relative topology if they're of opposite forces or or different forces and they create forces that want to push each other apart. And I've had some, uh, some collaborators at Johns Hopkins, the, the, I think it's the Kirby Brain Research Institute there, and they look at a lot of this uh, with MRI, looking at the T2 stuff and de deoxygenation blood, and, and they've kind of confirmed that, yes, these, these are small forces, but they're irrelevant at this scale. And so we want to keep, this is where we're going uh, in terms of looking at this, you know, is the human cardiac embryonic cardiac form influenced by that change in magnetic susceptibility <laughs> of heme that occurs with the introduction of placental oxygenation. And so that, yeah, so this is the, the blood heart. This is the single loop blood heart with the blood going from the body through the heart to the gill arches and then an introduction of a, of a small red stream that gets caught in with that stream and because it's of an opposite polarity or a different polarity, it wants to twist as it goes around, and then as they're hinged by the, as the, the skeletal, the skeleton of the uh, orifices, it wants to scissor apart, and that can help shape the direction of oxygenated blood into the upper pharyngeal arches and the blue blood being pushed down into the, into the sixth arch. There's some, that's the Johns Hopkins lads work there. Um, so this is kind of, this is the heart tube looking from behind again, from the dorsally, from, from the back. And you can see the blood coming in, the blue blood coming in from the body and running up through the single atrium, single ventricle, and out through the single trunk. And into there comes this little stream of oxygenated blood from the neoplacenta. And it wants to twist, and as it grows, it buckles, it tries to push away, it hinges away, and the heart goes from a, a, a linear tube to a C shape, where it actually bends. So, like I say, because we're looking from dorsally, the blood from the atria goes from dorsally forward, ventrally, into the ventricle, the so-named ventricle, and then it actually kicks back. If you go back and think about that fish heart, it's a reverse 45-degree angle. It's a really abrupt angle, and it's maintained in the human heart. People have studied the angles, etc. cetera. And, uh, so these kind of, to me, there's physics in all of this. Uh, at this sub-millimeter sub scale, and this is what we want to try and investigate. Does this actually happen? This is my theory, because no one's actually delineated in the heart tube, oxygenated from deoxygenated, or looked at this at this level. So this is where we're going with our research here at Martai. And this is kind of putting that same idea back into the actual anatomy. You can see the blood coming in from the four corners of the body into the single atrium, and reverse ejected back out into the pharyngeal arches and then a little bit of the oxygenated blood comes in from the placenta, worms its way around, spirals up into the ascending aorta selectively into the top branches, which start to become the, the carotids and start to provide that arterial highway to that you know, fish brain with its poor blood supply to suddenly start you know, feeding the, this, this human brain that loves oxygen clearly. And um, by the third slide, you've got a full creation of the of the arch, and what's happening, because it's spiraling through there, it's kind of selecting the, the arches to pull out the carotids and the left uh, arch, and the right arch actually 
just fades away because, because of the lack of blood supply. So it's sort of like a sympathetic supply in itself. So Wainui is my beach. I'm from Gisborne. I was born here. Taronganui Akiwa is my whenua. My blood is English. <laughs> and I'm really proud of uh, Matai for what it's achieved, for its connection to, uh, to the community, to everybody else. And uh, Jackie Chan would like to know what's the evidence for heart, my heart theory. So, moving on. This is a this is a MRI. Again, I've taken this, created this image using free software off the internet from an MRI of a baby, a three-month-old baby again, who presented with strider, born with noisy breathing. It got worse and worse, and that's classically what we call a vascular ring, where. You can imagine, you can see, you can see there's, a, there's an arch on either side around the, I've got this as a 3D model, you can look at it on sketchfabs.com slash hardest, you can zoom it around and see it, but you can, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an arch either side, so it's gripping the trachea like a ring. And so it's, it's the, the, the fourth arches, one has not uh, fallen away and the other is, um, you know, because normally the left arch retains and the, f the right arch disappears because the blood spirals. You can imagine the blood spiraling out of the heart and around and wanting to go down the left side and the right side by, just by lack of flow. It's a bit like the bone guy. You know, you don't use it, you lose it. And it's sort of an apoptosis process. And so um, normally the blood would go down one side and the other side would fade away and, and that would leave you with the branches. So surgically, to release, the, release this, we could go in on this side, which would actually be the easier side, and cut at the back there, but I'll show you from the other side. Uh, boom, there we are. Heart surgery 101. Um, we've released, we've, we've cut the, the, the tube, the, the arch at the back on the other side, which has created, which creates the brachiocephalic artery with the, with the subclavian and the left, um, the right subclavian coming off of it and the carotid, sorry, the, and then the left common carotid and then the left subclavian uh, going through as a left arch, so, which is normal cardiac anatomy. So we've really just done what nature hadn't failed to do because of some aberration in that twisting of the heart flow at that point when, that heart, when the aorta is developing at about five or six weeks embryologically. And so it's sort of like a, a frozen, a bit of frozen delayed development. Um, so let's do that again. There we go. So there's a double arch and trapping the aorta. The spiraling hasn't quite worked. So we clamp, clamp, and cut, and we create a normal, uh, a normal left-sided arch with this classic three three branch anatomy. Um, and this is kind of the idea of it here. Um, you know, the paired dorsal aorta, and and it's really. You know, the main bulk of the flow, the main bulk of the flow goes down the left arch, the, the right arch sort of withers away and, and it just becomes a single aorta down the back, which I haven't shown. Uh, and the vertebral arteries are, are sort of like uh, um, continuations of the dorsal, paired dorsal aorta. And as I mentioned before, you know, this, this, this spiraling red flow that's developing and scissoring into the upper branches is really providing that highway of high, uh, of re-accelerated oxygenated blood to the developing brain and, and really making it grow in, into, into the human brain that we know and love. Uh, this is an MRI taken 2008 from um, uh, somebody in Germany. And I had a, P, a very kindly uh, Professor Hunter, uh, co-supervisor, PhD, DHD student with me, uh, I got some, fun the only funding I ever got was 2008. It was 12,000 bucks from the Cardiac Society. No, oh, sorry, the Australasian Society of Cardiothoracic Surgeons, I should be correct. And I gave that to Peter and we hired a PhD student out of, uh, out of uh, uh, um, New Orleans, David Ladd, because I was interested in vortical flow. I was, I was trying to answer this question, why is there vortical flow? And we got this uh, 4D image uh, software and he, David stripped it all down and I wanted to, and he put spheres into the bloodline to create the, and so that's the center point of each sphere in the bloodline, so it creates a, it creates a flow line. Uh, it shows you the, the flow line of blood and so you can see the blood spiraling out of the heart through the ascending aorta, through the arch, down the descending aorta and at the top of the two carotid arteries and at the side of the two subclavian arteries and 
you know, in 2008, when I was first starting that, that really kind of, it was a strong image to me. It, 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 you know, it was like a, cor it's a coru, it's a growth, it's a growth spiral. And I showed it to Peter and Peter's like, yes, but what does it mean? And I tell you, <laughs> those, 20, those 10 years since, I've, that's, what, that's been my sole challenge is what does it mean? And I've been trying to, I've been hunting it down. Uh, and so, and it really kind of, and, and so I, you know, my, the idea is, as I said, it's the, this blue, this idea of this red blood coming into the blue stream. And so there's a couple of interesting, uh, just to finish up, um, congenital situations. One's called transposition of the great arteries, where the aorta and the pulmonary artery are switched, so they, blood, they come out parallel rather than crossed over. There are no genetic predisposition, no genetic markers for this syndrome. Uh, while you're in utero and on, on the uh, on the placenta, everything is fine. Well, you can see, though, uh, that the, the blue blood's actually going up to the third and fourth arches, and the, and the red blood's going towards the lungs. So rather than scissoring apart, they try to boomerang apart. And these kiddies are born, they're not getting as much oxygen to their brain. They're actually born with, they do have some developmental delays. Um, but to my mind, to explain this with the blood theory, it's like it has, the red has not twisted enough. There's not enough differential or, or some sort of things going on or the cell phone went off at the wrong time at, the wrong, at, the, at that stage of pregnancy where this is developing because this gets baked in in those first few weeks of life. And after that, it's done. Everything's moving on and growing. So, um, so the model sort of explains a very unusual uh, and non-survivable because once you're born, you have two parallel circuits. The red blood's going around from the... From the, uh, from the um, you know, from the lungs to the heart and back again and not going to the body, you have to create shunts and then operate within the first few days of life to switch those vessels over to save them. So it's, it's, a, it's a real anomaly, but the, the neat thing is the blood hypothesis help, may explain it. Uh, similarly for Tetralogy of Fallot, which is a, another congenital lesion uh, where there's over-rotation over and, and dextro rotation of the, of the ascending aorta, which overrides the septum, cause a, causes a hole in the heart, causes narrowing of the with this narrowing of the pulmonary outflow tract. And to my mind, you know, and there are some genetic uh, linkages, but, you know, 10, 20%, it's not a strong association, and, and you can't really point and go, that's the cause. Uh, but to my mind, if it's over-rotating, it's the, the red is impinging on the blue outflow, and, uh, and, and it's not letting the septum form in between where the two loops are scissoring apart in the ventricle. Uh, and... There's, an interest, there's a fifth aspect to tetralogy is, is, is that one quarter of patients all have a, have a right-sided aortic arch rather than a left. And it's almost like the blood has twisted too much and gone down the right arch and the left has faded away. So, um, so two slides on what we're going to do at Matai. Uh, yesterday I was thinking we would do some microfluidics. We would build these, um, fabricate you know, submillimetre tubes and put the red and blue blood in and, and change the magnetic fields and the oxygenation and look to see can we change the topology of those streams. Uh, and we still may do that, but there's, you can also do it in a chick embryo with micro MRI. Um, there's the link to Matai. <laughs> and um, so that is what we plan to do as of February next year. Uh, and I'll be looking for somebody who actually really knows what they're doing to be able to help me delineate this and, and, and uh, you know, Try and prove it wrong, which is the, which is the whole idea of science, right? Thank you. <laughs>